Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. This week, House Republicans are advancing several important items on the floor. Uh, but among these efforts, I want to make, take a moment to highlight our steadfast opposition to placing one-sided pressure on Israel as it battles Hamas. Our conference believes that any effort from the Biden administration to pressure, to pressure Israel into an immediate ceasefire without conditions weakens Israel's hand, makes it less likely that the hostages will be released and only benefits Hamas in the short term and the long term. The most frustrating part of the Biden administration's handling of this dire situation is that while Israel goes out of their way to work through back-channel negotiations and set up a temporary ceasefire to get as many of their hostages back as they can, Hamas continues to walk back these good faith efforts. Um, Hamas believes, and this is largely because they believe that the Biden administration will do the legwork for them. House Republicans refuse to stand for this, and we will remain committed to our ally Israel in their fight against the evils of terrorism. I thank you for your time. We have uh, several to speak today, and we will start with uh, my colleague from Florida, Maria Salazar, and she'll speak further on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, and to, thanks to all of you for being here, and to Speaker Johnson to allow me the opportunity to introduce this resolution. Uh, and uh, our position is that the horrors of October 7th, the attack against Israel, will continue to live in infamy. After six months, we're all still fighting to shine a light against the terrorist group called Hamas and the supported uh, and its uh, support um, from Iran, which is the, the greatest evil. We're also opposed to the Biden administration's misguided calls for a one-sided ceasefire. And that is why I proposed Resolution 1117 or 1117 to affirm that we, the House of Representatives, stands strongly against evil, period, in all its forms. Unfortunately, the White House has sent a very clear message that empowers Hamas by subduing Israel to a one-sided ceasefire. Because one thing is clear, Hamas started this unprovoked conflict and they have no intention of ending it. With this resolution, we're sending a very strong message to the international community that we stand with the only democracy in the Middle East, Israel. Through our words, our resolutions, we are conveying a very clear message that we support Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu as he leads his country in permissible acts of self-defense. But it is also very important to mention our intention to break the chokehold that Hamas has over the Palestinians. Poor victims being used by this evil force that is the is only in the business of power. Hamas is not in the business of bringing prosperity or well-being to the Palestinians. The suffering of the Palestinian people under Hamas is immense. 33,000 have died, 70,000 have been injured in this war that Hamas started. And why are they starving? Why are they hungry? In the last week, over 1,000 trucks full of food and medicine have entered Gaza allowed by Israel. And now there are three new corridors to pass food and medicine to the Palestinians. Those are open too. But Hamas always manipulates for political purpose. Hamas cares a lot more to win the war of propaganda against Israel than the war of poverty against its own people. So, Democrats do not have the monopoly on compassion. We are compassionate too, we Republicans. And the compassionate thing to do is to let Israel finish this war so they can end the reign of terror that Hamas has unleashed on the whole region, specifically on the Palestinians. This Congress and this great nation has a long tradition of defending their righteous might. And we will continue our tradition of standing for the freedom of our allies and against terror abroad. We will not stand for one-sided calls for Israel to stand down. And we stand firmly with Israel and its right to defend itself. I yield back. Now I want to introduce our whip, Honorable Congressman Emmer. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate it. Uh, this past Sunday actually marked six months since Hamas carried out an attack that resulted in the most deadly day for Jews since the Holocaust. 
It's been six months since Hamas broke a ceasefire to slaughter innocent people in their homes, rape women, kill children, and parade their victims through the streets. It's been six months that an unknown number of Israeli and American hostages have been held in Gaza by Hamas. But unfortunately, over the last six months, the Democrat Party has cemented its place as the pro-Hamas party. Look no further than President Biden giving Israel ceasefire ultimatums or Chuck Schumer calling for new elections in Israel. I should probably be thinking about Gaza, where they haven't had one since 2006. This issue is simple. It's a matter of good versus evil, and there is zero room to equivocate. So this week, House Republicans will once again give our Democrat colleagues the opportunity to correct their pro-Hamas record by voting in favor of a common sense resolution that opposes efforts to place one-sided pressure on Israel with respect to Gaza. We already saw 194 House Democrats side with Hamas by voting against critical Israel aid in November of last year. 166 of them doubled down when given the opportunity to correct their pro-Hamas record in February. I hope this time that this time has that the time that has passed has granted them the strength to stand for what is right by voting in favor of our resolution this week. Regardless of what they decide, Americans can rest assured that House Republicans' support for our strongest ally in the Middle East will not waver. And now I yield to our leader, Steve Scalise. Thank you, Whip. We're going to have a lot of important debates on the floor this week. Uh, we're going to hear from the Prime Minister of Japan tomorrow, and we look forward to welcoming him into the chamber. But as you go around the country, as a number of us do, to talk about a lot of the issues that people care about and want to see Congress and the President addressing, there are some very, very important issues that we're focusing on that this President has walked away from. Uh, people around the country want a secure American border. And President Biden, from his first day in office, set us on a course to have an open border to the tune of over 8 million people. More than 35 states in America don't have a population that big of people who have come into our country illegally because the president opened up our southern border. And he refuses to reverse course now that everybody knows how dangerous the steps he's taken have been for our country. You think about the national security implications when you see uh, scores of people on the terrorist watch list who have been caught coming into our country. Those are just the ones we know of. We don't know how many haven't been caught who are on the terrorist watch list who have come into America because they want to do us harm and now they're able to because President Biden opened up the southern border. So we're bringing a resolution to call out the president on the steps he's taken specifically to open the border. They're very well listed out in Tony Gonzalez's resolution, and we denounce those actions because we as House Republicans want a secure southern border, just like most Americans do. We passed H.R. 2, a bill that would actually secure America's border. President Biden opposed that bill because he doesn't want to secure the border. Speaker Johnson, time and time again, has tried to engage President Biden in an actual discussion about how we can work together to secure the board border, and President Biden won't even meet with the Speaker to talk about those specific actions because President Biden doesn't want a secure border. There's something else that President Biden has changed his tune on, and you go back over the years, uh, but especially in these last few months, President Biden has walked away from the strong relationship we have with Israel. Uh, you saw Majority Leader Schumer's comments calling uh, for the Prime Minister of Israel to be replaced during a time of war. Who walks away from a friend during a time of war? That's when you stand with your friends the most, as House Republicans continue to do. We are proud to stand with Israel in their right to defend themselves. As Maria Elvira Salazar laid out, not just here at the podium, but in her resolution that every member of Congress is going to have the opportunity to vote on in just a few hours. Do you stand with Israel or not in a time of war and their right to defend themselves from a terrorist organization who ended the ceasefire? If there's any talk of ceasefire, President Biden, that ended on October 7th when Hamas decided to barbarically murder not just Jews in Israel, 
but others. They're still holding over 100 hostages, including American citizens. And when President Biden called for a ceasefire, he didn't precondition it on Hamas releasing the hostages. You just looked the other day in Michigan. There was a rally held where they were chanting death to America. And President Biden's White House was asked just yesterday, will you denounce those chants of death to America? And President Biden's administration refused to denounce that. When you can't stand up to chants of death for America in America, and then you walk away from your ally Israel, this president has lost his way because he's worried about bowing to the radical left who has walked away from Israel. Will House Republicans will continue to stand by our ally, especially in this time of war? as Prime Minister Netanyahu and his whole coalition government stand united to eradicate this terrorist organization known as Hamas, sponsored by Iran. Nobody should be walking away with, uh, from them. We should all be standing together, Republican and Democrat, uh, to show our strength and solidarity with our great ally Israel. And we're going to give everybody that opportunity on the House floor. With that, I'll try to bring up our speaker, Mike Johnson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Leader. Appreciate you all for being here. Good morning. Hope you had a good uh, Easter. We are uh, back in, in, in business and a lot going on this week, as you've heard, and, and I know you're all in tune to all that. As you know, uh, has been noted here, today the House is going to be voting on this resolution to denounce Biden's administration uh, immigration policies. Every American should be paying attention to how the representative votes on that. We've been talking about this ad nauseum in this room and everywhere at every press conference and every media uh, appearance that we've had for the last many months, for the last three years for that matter, because since Joe Biden went into the Oval Office beginning on day one, they began to open that border wide. And we, you know, the people in this room know very well, we've documented 64 specific executive actions and agency actions that he and Secretary Mayorkas and others took intentionally, deliberately to open the border wide and send the welcome uh, message to everybody around the globe, including violent criminals and terrorists and foreign nationals here coming here to do us um, harm. And, and the numbers, the official number is about 9 million people have been encountered at that southern border just in the last three years and, and a few months. Uh, but we all know, and I think intuitively we understand the numbers much, much higher than that because we don't, ha we don't have any idea how many people actually have come across totally undetected. The Godaways number, I don't know, close to uh, 3 million now, I think is the official number. But look, I, I think, I say this often, I think the number's probably somewhere close to 16 million people by now that have gotten into this country illegally. Where are they? What, what are they plotting? What are they doing? We, we would suspect that there are terrorist cells set up now, and, and some of these known terrorists, the 340-plus that have been uh, apprehended at the border, that were, there were suspected terrorists on the terrorism watch list, um, we, we got those, but we don't know how many of them came in un, un, undetected. And, and we know that 70 percent of Americans disapprove of Biden's decision to open that border. I, that's the official number again, but I think anecdotally I've been out, I think I've been in 23 states now the last uh, few months uh, on the campaign trail and doing events around the country. I'm, I'm telling you, the sentiment out there is almost universal, that people know that this is a disastrous situation. It's a catastrophe that was caused by intentional policy choices. It also means, conversely, that policy choices can get us out of this. And that's why this election cycle is so important. But that's another subject for another day. This is an opportunity for Democrats today to distance themselves from Joe Biden's broken border. And if they stand with him, it'll be yet another sign to the American people that Democrats don't want border security. Good luck with that argument. Uh, with regard to Israel, it's not just the border. It's Democrats are weak on Israel as well. And it, it's, it's their support for Israel. And it's rather stunning to us that there's this dramatic shift Hamas is holding more than 130 hostages, as you know, including Americans, and these people are languishing at the hands of barbaric terrorists, and Joe Biden is, meanwhile, giving ultimatums to Israel, not Hamas. And shamefully, since October 7th, Joe Biden has transformed into an anti-Israel president. There's really no other way to, to, to characterize it. He's more concerned, seemingly, with placating the anti-Semitism in his, in his base than, than standing with our historic and vitally important ally. And it's not just the White House. No one has forgotten, of course, that Chuck Schumer has, did the unthinkable by opining on and, and meddling in Israel's elected leadership. I mean, it's just, these are unthinkable um, developments. And it's shocking to us, but it continues. Just days ago, over 50 House Democrats called for Biden to withhold arms transfers to Israel. It's wrong and it's dangerous, and it shows the Democrats are losing their moral clarity on the issue. 
Uh, this week, uh, we'll be uh, reauthorizing FISA, and we're going to do a, a big reform on the intelligence program. We're enacting sweeping changes, over 50 reforms, 56 to be exact, to the program that are in the base text that will stop uh, the abuse of politicized FBI queries and prevent another Russia hoax debacle, among many other uh, important reforms. No more steel dossiers, no more, no more of the intelligence community relying on fake news reports to order a FISA order, no more collusion. The, these changes will make sure that that doesn't happen. And Congress is stepping in because the FBI is, has frankly failed to adequately police its own agents, and the agency is in need of dramatic culture change. This is an important first step in that. And the real culture change will come, we know, after the election cycle when, when Republicans are in charge again in the White House and the Senate and the House, and we'll be able to, 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 uh, to really do the dramatic reforms that are necessary. It's critical we address these abuses because we don't want uh, to be able to use or, or to, to lose Section 702 of FISA. It's a, it's a critically important uh, piece of our intelligence and law enforcement in this country because it allows us to continue killing Hamas terrorists. You have to stop the terrorists before they kill Americans. It allows us to track shipments of illicit chemicals used to make fentanyl. It allows us to protect U.S. warships from attacks by Houthi rebels. It allows us to stop China from stealing American intellectual property, and, and it prevents ransomware attacks against American companies. That's, that's all the things that are empowered and allowed by this, this set of laws, this statute, and we, we can't allow that to expire or lapse. Our bill provides that and uh, for all these things, and, I, and, and our, college, our colleagues, I, I think, will support it. Uh, we can protect the Fourth Amendment rights of Americans, clearly, and we can, we can protect them in their person as well. We have to strike the balance. Government always does. You have to protect, jealously guard the fundamental liberty of the American people, which I made a career doing before I came to Congress as a religious liberty defense lawyer and a constitutional defense lawyer in the courts. So you protect the liberty, but at the same time, you get to protect their security, and we can't allow a critical tool like this to just expire and, and go out of use. So um, we, we think the House will, will take the right steps, and uh, with that, we yield to a few questions. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Good morning. Thank you. We're meeting later this morning with Marjorie Taylor Greene. What is your message to her? And previously, she had said that she would move to vacate the chair if you put a Ukraine aid bill on the floor. We haven't seen the hide and the hair of that bill yet. Is that part of this conversation? Well, on the supplemental, the, the House members are continuing to actively discuss her options on a path forward. There are a lot of different ideas on that, as you know. It's a very complicated matter at a very complicated time. Uh, and uh, the clock is ticking on it, and everyone here feels the urgency of that. But um, what's required is that you reach consensus on it, and that's what we're working on. With regard to uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, She's a colleague. I've always considered her a friend. Marjorie and I don't disagree, I don't, I don't think, on any matter of uh, philosophy. Um, we're both conservatives, you know, but uh, we do disagree sometimes on, on strategy and uh, with regard to what we put on the floor and when and those things. And Marjorie is, um, is frustrated by the last uh, appropriations package, the spending bills, and you know what? So am I. I mean, here's the reality that we have to remind everybody, and you all know in the room because you're here every day, but some people back home don't realize, we have the smallest majority in U.S. history. We've got a one-vote margin right now. Um, this is an historic moment. There's never been anything like this. And at the same time, uh, we Republicans only have that majority in one house. We don't have it in the Senate, obviously, where Chuck Schumer and the Democrats are in charge. And we obviously don't have the White House right now. That's a Democrat there, too. So we are not going to get, because of that reality, we are not going to be able to do big transformational changes that, that we'd like, that we know are necessary And for example, the budgeting and spending. We're, we're not going to get all of our priorities. We will never get 100 percent of what we want and believe is necessary for the country because that's the reality. It's a math. It's a, it's a matter of math in, in, the, in the Congress. Uh, the numbers, the votes that are available. And so uh, it, it doesn't serve our interest, I didn't think, to not fund the government and shut it down at this critical time because imagine a scenario where Border Patrol agents aren't being paid. Uh, TSA agents aren't being paid, flights start getting canceled, we're not paying the troops, you know, all the things that the government does would come to a grinding halt. That would put a lot of pressure on the American people, the American economy at a very desperate time. We can't have large sections of the border being totally unpatrolled. Some of them are right now. We can't not pay Border Patrol agents. So that just wasn't an option. And I don't think that would be helpful to us from a political standpoint for the Republican Party to continue to govern, to maintain, keep, and then grow our majority in November. I thought that would have been a great hindrance to it. Uh, and, and so that wouldn't be helpful, and nor, nor does the motion to vacate 
uh, uh, help us in that regard either. It would be chaos in the House. So um, Marjorie and I are, are uh, going to visit uh, later today and um, look forward to the conversation. And I'm, I'm not going to discuss it anymore. I'm going to discuss it with you all. I'll discuss it with her. Have you spoken to Donald Trump about this? And have you asked him for his support for you to stay in the job? Uh, I'm not going to comment on private conversations with the with, uh, President Trump, I, I talk to him frequently, but I'm, I'm not going to comment on that here. I'll talk about Is House leadership going to be whipping against the judiciary's amendment um, on warrant requirements for the price bill? No, we don't. We don't whip on amendments. Um, we had a, a conversation in the Republican conference meeting just before this, and uh, there's lots of ideas and thoughts on the amendments, and uh, the, the body will work its will. But um, we're we're really we're really enthusiastic about this. Uh, uh, revised this package because remember it these 56 reforms were reached by a real consensus process I mean over many months and many many weeks of a special task force working together countless hours and you had members of Judiciary Committee the Intelligence Committee Hipsy and you had three members who were uninvolved in that uh, before who came together and, and agreed upon this long list that made it into the base text and uh, we'll see what happens with the amendments but I, I think that's gonna be a very very important thing <laughs> What's your reaction to former President Trump's comments saying instead of reauthorizing FISA to kill him? Well, I, I look forward to talking with him about it. I mean, here's the thing about FISA. He's not wrong, of course. They, they abused FISA. The whole Carter Page uh, investigation, that whole fiasco, was built on a false premise, as we know, the, uh, the, the fake Russian dossier and all the other things. Um, but these reforms would actually kill the abuses that allowed President Trump's campaign to be spied on. And... Uh, there are massive new, for example, criminal and civil penalties uh, for using opposition research or for leaking FISA applications or illegal spying. If, if an FBI agent or an attorney is involved in something like that, under these reforms and this reform package, they could get 10 years of jail time, 10 years of jail time if they commit those abuses again. I mean, that's really, that's real teeth. And there's a number of other reforms and measures in there. Um, President Trump used the intel from this program to kill terrorists. And we have to kill. We have to uh, kill the abuses so that we can do uh, both of those things and continue. And that's what this bill does. So, um, thank you all for being here this morning, and uh, stay tuned for more developments. Thank you.